today. Uh, yesterday, what we did is we cover the course uh, syllabus requirements, the class structures. Then we start with the introduction to the Chinese Tipitaka uh, with the introduction and uh, also, you know, the comparison. Um, then we start with um, introduction to Agama Nikaya. Uh, and we finish one of the one of the uh, sutta, which is uh, SN 22.57. I don't have it in front of me, but you know, <clears throat> what we did, uh, what we are going to do today is in the morning, <clears throat> we'll continue with the Agama Nikaya. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with another sutra, called MN18, which is called the Honey Ball Sutra. So we'll, we'll uh, go over that uh, with reading and discussion. And <clears throat> that's, that's it in the morning. But you know, this sutra, it's, it's pretty long. And then we have a lot of information that we like to share. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll start and then Q&A um, discussion will be in the morning. So, so hopefully uh, by 11, by 11 o'clock this morning, we'll start our Q&A. So the Q&A probably will refer back to what we have learned yesterday and this morning, uh, the MN18. So in the afternoon, we'll start introduction to Prajna Paramita. I, you know, schedule one hour of introduction. I'm not sure if that's enough or not, but we'll, we'll try it. Then we'll start with the Dao Xing Bora, the 8,000 verses of Prajna Paramita. <laughs> so that would be, uh, I'll show you guys the book by Edward Combs. Um, but you know, the passage, we're not going to read the entire book, but uh, I selected some of the uh, passages from the book, which I think it's, uh, I think that we should know because it's very similar to the Ha Sutra. And also, you know, it's got the ingredient of the Diamond Sutra. So, uh, so we'll do that in the afternoon. There is no question or discussion section in the afternoon because I'm saying, saving all the Q&A and discussion uh, the week after. So on the 15th, after we finish the entire Prajna Paramita. So we'll, we'll do that. Uh, today we will start with MN18, trying to pull the slide up. So we went through all those. Mm. Okay, we'll do that in the discussion because I have something that We finish the 2257 with the direct no, then we're today, that's where we are. <clears throat> Is everybody ready for that? Sure. Okay. But before you start, can you tell me where these uh, are, what, what you labeled these okay. PDFs? W uh, what yeah. are those labeled? Okay, the, the one that I'm showing, is uh, NA-1. Okay. It says Nakaya Agama. Can you find it? I will. <laughs> I, think I, I think I downloaded that, but I thought it was only one page. That's okay. Go ahead and start. I'll, I'll find it. Okay, it's it's from last night. Oh, 
Yeah, it was yeah. just uploaded uh, last just night at 9.48, way past my bedtime. Oh. 9.48, okay, I had 8.44, let me look. Let me see if I can find that one. That's all right, go ahead and I'll find it. Okay, so uh, this sutta is a pretty long sutta. So when I gave a talk on this, I based on the Kabodi's version. But, um, oh, by the way, the two suttas, uh, SN 22.57, and also this uh, MN 18, when I upload it, uh, I, you know, uh, use both the Kabodi's translation and Thanissaro's translation. Also, I included the Pali in the file. So just in case anybody would like to, you know, uh, to, to read in Pali, then that would be, that would be uh, good too. So what I am going to, I would say let's stay with the Kobodi's translation for, because that's what we did yesterday uh, for the SN 22.57. So today with the Sutta 18, the honey ball, we will stick uh, with the Kobodi's translation which is on your work file. It's page number six. Can anybody find it? I'll wait till everybody finds it. Let me know. I'm juggling a few things, so um, but I'll find it. Okay, because I need somebody to read it. Okay, uh, I asked for you to start your uh, webcam, unless you're just not wanting it on. Is it not on? Your webcam, no, your screen share's on, your webcam's not. Oh, how about that? There we go. <laughs> okay. So um, I need somebody to read. It's like one, two, three, about three pages. Uh, or Francesca, would, would you like to read? Or? Yes, um, we're reading MN18. MN18, page six. It's but the Kobodi's version of translation. And my file is six pages long. Hang on. Oh, no, there it is. It's still displaying on my screen here. Okay. Ah, here we are. Okay. So you want to read the entire sutta or you want to share reading? Uh, probably we can share reading. Okay, and Lee, can you share some of the reading? When he finds. Um, I've okay. got it, I could do that. Okay. Are we ready? Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country at Kapilavatu in Negrota's Park. Two. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Kapila, Kapilavatu for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Kapilavatu and had returned from his alms round, after his meal, he went to the great wood for the day's abiding and entering the great wood, sat down at the root of a bilva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani, the Sakyan, while walking and wandering for exercise, also went to the great wood, and when he had entered the great wood, he went to the Bilva sapling where the Blessed One was and exchanged greetings with him. When his courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side, leaning on his stick, and asked 
the Blessed One. What does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? Friend, I assert and proclaim such a teaching that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. In this generation, with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and people, such a teaching that perceptions no more underlie that brahmin who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. When this was said, Dandapani the Sakyan shook his head, wagged his tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered in three lines. Then he departed, leaning on his stick. Then, when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to Negrota's park, where he sat down on a seat made ready for him and told the bhikkhus what had taken place. Then a certain bhikkhu asked the Blessed One, but venerable sir, what is the teaching that the Blessed One asserts, whereby one does not quarrel with anyone in the world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas? In this generation, with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people? And venerable sir, how is it that perceptions no more underlie that brahmin who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. Because as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinged by mental, mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to view, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Then, soon after the Blessed One had gone, the bhikkhus considered, Now, friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. Now who will expound this in detail? Then, when, then they considered, the venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and asked him the meaning of this. Then the bhikkhus went to the venerable Mahakachana and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down to one side and told him what had taken place, adding, let the Venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The Venerable Mahakachana replied, Friends, it is as though a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, and after he had passed over the root, the honeyball, and the trunk. And so it is with you, Venerable Sirs, that you think that I should be asked about the meaning of this after you passed the Blessed One by when you were face to face with the teacher. For knowing, the Blessed One knows. Seeing, he sees. He is vision. He is knowledge. He is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One. He is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata, the Tagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you, so should you have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing, he sees, he is vision, the Tathagata, Tathagata. That was the time when we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, so we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. 
The Venerable Maha Kachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding the detailed meaning. Let the Venerable Maha Kachana expound it without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the bhikkhus replied. The Venerable Maha Kachana said this, friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling, after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, bhikkhus, as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome, and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of it to be as follows. You Dependent want, uh, on me to share? Would you like? Lee, did you find a? I can't. I can't find it. Okay. Lee, I'll what, alert it to uh, to the Zoom chat. It's NA dash three reading two MN eighteen uh, doc X on page six. Okay. So. Friend, so, David, you can you do it? Which we're now in seven. Yeah, uh, the reading sure. started on page six. I was trying to find a end of a paragraph. We're at 15, right? Friends, yeah, when the bus... 16, right? We start at 16, right? 16, okay. Yeah. Fr Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, Here. that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With that one as mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation to set a man with respect to past, future, and present forms, cognizable through the eye. An uh, sutta sutta. Anyway, dependent on the ear and sounds, dependent on the nose and odors, dependent on the tongue and flavors, dependent on the body and tangibles, and dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as a source, Perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation to set the man with respect to past, future, and present mind objects cognizable to the mind. When there is the eye, a form, and eye consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is a manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is a manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation. When there is the ear, a sound, and ear consciousness. When there is the nose, an odor, and nose consciousness. When there is the tongue, a flavor, and tongue consciousness. When there is a body, a tangible and body consciousness. When there is the mind, a mind object, and mind consciousness. It is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged by mental pro pro proliferation. 
When there is no I, no form, and no I consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is no manifestation of contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is no manifestation of feeling, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation. When there is no ear, no sound, and no ear consciousness, then there is, when there is no nose, no odor, and no nose consciousness, The honey ball, 205. Okay. Uh, that's the reference, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when there is no tongue, no flavor, and no tongue consciousness, when there is no body, no tangible, and no body consciousness, when there is no mind, no mind object, and no mind consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling and giving a summary in brief, without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, bhikkhus as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man. If nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, and of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of this summary to be thus. Now, friends, if you wish, go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this. As the Blessed One explains it to you, so you should remember it. Then the bhikkhus, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Maha Kachana's words, rose from their seats and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he had left, adding, Then, Venerable Sir, we went to the Venerable Mahakachana and asked him about the meaning. The Venerable Mahakachana expounded this meaning to us with these terms, statements, and phrases. Mahakachana is wise, Bhikkhus. Mahakachana has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same way that Maha Kachana has explained it. Such is the meaning of this, and so you should remember it. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if a man exhausted my hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball in the course of uh, eating it, he would find a sweet delectable flavor. So too, venerable sir, any able-minded bhikkhu in the course of scrutinizing with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable sir, what is the name of this discourse on the Dhamma? As to what, as to that, Ananda, you may remember this discourse on the Dhamma as the honeyball discourse. That is what the Blessed One said. 
the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Thank you. Thank you, friend. So, um, what do you guys think about the, well, there are some footnotes by Bhikkhu Bodhi, but, you know, uh, let's save that, you know, and come back to it later if we cannot figure it out. Is there any question so far after, you know, hearing the sutta? Any comment? So I wonder why they didn't ask the Buddha about the meaning. <laughs> Yeah. That's that's a good question. That's a very good question. Uh, let me get back to the screen sharing and then Were they afraid? Afraid to ask a question. Afraid to ask the question. Too, too, too much too much in awe of being in his presence that they forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anybody had any answer at all? I'm trying to go to the chat, but doesn't look like it allows me to. Uh, click the more up at the top. I think yours is. Uh, so if you put your mouse up at the top, you see the little three dots, it says more. Oh, oh, okay. And then you should see chat. But there's nothing exciting in there just yet. Oh, okay. Well, it, touches, uh, it seems to touch on direct knowing again, directly knowing. <laughs> Without the experience, you, you you can't know directly. Okay. The uh, no eye consciousness, no manifestation of uh, perception. Um. No contact. No manifestation of feeling. Okay. Um, let's start with Mahakachana. What do you guys think about Mahakachana? No idea. I, I, I like that. He says, hey, why don't you ask the Buddha? <laughs> <laughs> he was right there. <laughs> You wait and ask me. Yeah. <laughs> well, Go to the source, guys. <laughs> the <clears throat> Mahakachana, Venerable Mahakachana, is actually uh, given a title called the Master of Exposition of the Dhamma by the Buddha. Okay. So, and this title was given by the Buddha to him. So he is uh, supposed to be the master of exposition of the Dhamma. So what happened is in this occasion, you know, a Brahmin uh, from Buddha's country, uh, own country, came to him and asked the question. Uh, at, in that occasion, you know, there were fights and, and quarrels among uh, those non-Buddhist sat. So this Brahmin got frustrated and came to the Buddha and asked, you know, uh, what are you teaching Bhikkhu or, or Rekus? So in a very impolite uh, manner, then the Buddha gave him the sermon. Now this sermon is supposed to be, it's called a honey ball, but it's an, an analyst of conflict and the cause of conflict. So the, the, the core is to analyze why, you know, analyze the conflict and why those conflicts uh, arise. 
So even though the, it's called the honey ball. Um, so Buddha, just very shortly, this is the style we have to understand how Buddha uh, expound his discourse. Sometimes he will go into a very detailed, very long um, discourse. Sometimes he will just utter uh, a verse and let the disciples figure it out, ponder on it, investigate it. So it happened that in this occasion, the Buddha decided to just say a few words and turned around. Uh, I don't know why, because you know the sutta didn't tell why, but because this is a sutta called, you know, uh, Mahakashana Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta. So uh, <clears throat> maybe he know that, you know, Mahakashana is there, and it would be, you know, he, he or maybe he's tired. Okay, so he just returned to his quarter. So. Um, this is not very unusual when the Buddha gave a sermon, gave a discourse, and let his great disciples to explain it. For example, you know, he had occasions like let Sariputra or Moganala or Anunuda to explain what the meaning of um, his saying. So, Sariputra and Mahakachana are those two very frequently by the other, uh, you know, ask questions by the uh, other disciples. Now they do share, uh, and this is from Bhikkhu Bodhi's explanation, they, you know, they do share similar techniques. Both of them like to use systematic analysis. <clears throat> to explain the meaning. Uh, Shariputra, <clears throat> Sariputra would be, would start with a specific topic. Say, okay, if this time the Buddha is going to talk about the Four Noble Truths, so he would start with the Four Noble Truths and then uh, explain it, you know, explain the Buddha's teaching based on those topics. That's his style. Now, Mahakachana, on the other hand, would begin with uh, the Buddha's utterance or verses, and then unfold each statement. So that's the two styles by different disciples. Um, <clears throat> now, Buddha, we know that he 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 is the uh, he is a very very skillful teacher that almost nobody uh, can match up his skillfulness, um, especially in resolving conflicts. I would like to share with you one story about how he share the conflicts. Uh, one time, a Brahmin again, you know. He's a Brahmin leader. So he used to have a lot of the followers following him. But then all of a sudden he find out that the entire family just went to the Buddha and pay homage and none under the Buddha. So a lot of his, his followers would go to the Buddha and become the Buddha's disciple. So he it was very, very upset. So he decided to, you know, including his own family, so he decided to go and argue with the Buddha and challenge him. He made up his mind that I'm not going to let my anger subside. You know, I am going to keep this anger with me so that, you know, I can uh, lash my anger on to the Buddha. So he keep on, you know, cursing, cursing, cursing. So when he arrived to, to the Buddha, he's really furious and, and very frustrated. So uh, he uh, just, you know, get very angry with the Buddha without stopping. 
So he taught, he said to the Buddha that I'm not going to listen with you, uh, uh, listen to you. You know, you, you don't say anything to me. I just want to bring my anger and lash, lash out on you. The Buddha said that, you know, very calmly that I would like to just ask one question. He said, okay, you ask. So the Buddha said that, do you have a lot of visitors? He said, of course, I have a lot of followers. And when they come and visit you, do they bring presents? And the, Raku, the Brahmin said that, of course, they bring me a lot of, lot of presents. And then the Buddha asked, if they bring you the present and you don't want it, how do you do it? Then I return it to them. So the Buddha said, you came to me with this cursing and anger as a present. I'm not going to take it. So you can keep it. So this is one of the way he solved, resolved the yam instead of arguing. That's the way he resolved the problem. So uh, this is just a demonstration. It's not that the Buddha uh, don't have the answer, but I think he would like to, you know, uh, Mahakachana to explain to it. Now, he, this occasion, he is in his homeland, Kapilavatu. So I'm not sure if, you know, um, he doesn't want to confront or, you know, explain or whatever in there. But, you know, it just happened that Mahakachana was there to uh, help him with that. Um, the entire sutta, it's, it's not uh, a very short one, you know, it's not just a few lines, which I have seen that there are suttas just like three or four lines. This one, um, there is a key concept in here. And I think, you know, since we have been uh, practicing for a while, you shouldn't be, uh, strange or, or uh, like um, not hear about this, the term called, pap, called papancha. Have anybody heard about that or not hear, heard about that before? I like your cat, so cute. Jeff. <laughs> so, Anybody not hear the, the term papancha before? Everybody heard about it? I have heard of this word before. It's been a while, so could you please um, remind me what papancha means? I kind of forgot. Okay. The translation into English is called mental proliferation. One example is like, say if we, we are meditating and you hear the dog bark. So at the beginning, I say that, okay, the dog barks. I'm not going to pay attention to the dog because I'm meditating. So you start, keep on, you know, meditating. But the dog won't stop. So keep barking, barking, barking. And finally, you know, you can't stand it. And your mind will say that, yeah, I'm meditating, but it's very annoying. You know, the dog is disturbing me. So, so the mind, the thoughts start, instead of paying attention to the breath, it starts to go outward to the dog. Why, why couldn't it stop? Is he hungry? Then the next thought will come like, whose dog is that? Why can't you know them stop the dog barking? Shall I go out and you know talk to them? But the dog won't stop, Just keep barking. The next thought will come up like, my goodness, 
Should I take out my gun? So this, this kind of thought keep going and going and going and going. So when I am doing the Dhamma talk, um, and I see, you know, a, a cup of water, Cho just gave me a cup of water. So when I look at a cup of water, and I, and I look at it, I say, oh, it says, May, Lily of the Valley. That's on the cup. Where did I buy it? Oh, it's in that location. We went to um, Smoky Mountain. When did we go to Smoky Mountain? Is it in a summer day? No, no, no. It's in the winter. Wow, it was so cold there. Wow, I wish I was in Hong Kong because the weather is so good. Oh, Hong Kong. How about have a bowl of wonton noodle soup? See how the mind goes, it never stops. From one thing jumping to another, jumping to another, jumping to another. And I forgot that I'm doing a Dharma talk here. Okay. That's what mental proliferation goes. Sometimes it just goes so wild, it's totally unrelated to what you are doing at this point, okay? But there are conditions, what we call the sequence of papancha. If you look at the screen, I have a map drawn up. So at the beginning, we'll take the eye as an example. I have my eyeball, they are intact. Uh, it's functioning with the lens and everything. So, and then I look at the computer in front of me and the eyeball won't do anything because it's a physical form. But when my eyeball come in contact, that's one contact, okay? Contact means differently in different area. So when my eye come, I, let me not use the word contact. When my eyeball touch, the screen, or not touch, touch is not a good word. Come across, how about, okay. My eyeball won't do anything, except after that, it arises something called the eye faculty. Eye faculty, it's a physical form that we cannot see with our naked eye. Same as our tongue, our nose, our ear, okay? We have that, those invisible faculties that is a physical form. So when that faculty functions, something called contact start, okay? Take it back, one more step back. When the eyeball come across an object externally, stimulate the faculty of the eye to function, then give rise to what we call the eye consciousness. Three things together. The eye faculty, the external object, and then the eye consciousness three things meet together, give rise to something called contact actually happen. So that is the time when contact actually happen. Then at that, when the contact actually happen, immediately our sixth consciousness of differentiation, perception, will function and give rise to the feeling. I see this screen, it's too bright. I don't like it. I'm going to turn the light down. Feeling arises. Then perception, where does perception come from? Perception is an evaluation. 
evaluation based on what? Based on our experience. Okay, so that happened. Then we start to think, think about it. Okay, I like, I don't like, you know, this is the screen. This is what is the, you know, what we label as a cup. This is, you know, what is annoying me. This is what uh, really I like, you know, satisfying me. Then we think about that. We think about that, then kick off the process of papancha. So far, okay. Question? If we're okay with that, that means we know, you know, how our internal, well, I call it internal, it's not really inside the body, but you know, internal means, you know, this five aggregates. When we touch, come, come across to the object outside, that will stimulate the function of our internal faculty, eye, eye faculty, ear, ear faculty, nose, nose faculty, you know, so on and so forth. Then that faculty will start to give rise or, or kick on the function of the consciousness of that specific sense uh, door, okay? The example I just gave, the ear, we're meditating. Our sense doors are com coming down to a very calm and quiet status. But then because our ear hears a sound, it's just, I hear something. Shouldn't use the, the word, even here, because my ear touches something outside. Then my ear faculty start to function. Then that will kick on to my ear consciousness. The physical form faculty, external object, the ear consciousness, three things together give rise to a term called contact start. When the contact started, we hear. Okay. Now, at that time, the sound, the dog sound, I don't like because it's disturbing me. So a sensation of unpleasantness, an agree agreeable, start to arise. Then we go back to our memory bank and say that, okay, this is something called the dog's barking and I don't like it. Let me see what I can do with it. Then the thinking process start. Now, when the thinking process start, Papancha starts. Papancha starts, that means we can do a lot of things, okay? We can decide to annoy it. So that is a decision by the sixth consciousness. After, uh, after perception, volition start. Volition is when we start, this, should I do anything or should I not do anything? Shall I keep on bringing my breath to my meditation or shall I go and get a gun? Okay, so when volition starts, it's almost, you know, on, on the uh, process of no returning. So the 12th link of depending on origination there are a lot, it's a chain, a link, you know, chain, you know, one section linking to another, linking to another, you know, and then it's circle, circle, circle. Where to cut off this link of samsara, circle of rebirth. 
one way, the contact bound to be there, okay? The feeling when contact start, no way that, you know, there, it's a river or no return, that feeling will start, perception will start. It's the time when volition, you know, the sankara, volition, start to decide to do anything about it. Like, shall I keep on meditating or shall I go and get a gun? That is the time that, you know, we can check that. Is that a wholesome action? Is that an unwholesome action? mentally not not you know physical or, or verbal yet that's the time we can cut off cut off the craving cut off the aversion or ignoring we cannot cut off until we're fully enlightened okay we, we can try to practice to at least minimize so that is the process of papancha now, the papancha, if you look at, um, see if I can get that picture on my screen also. Okay. Okay, if you look at, you know, the, the uh, chart that I have with the mental polyvalent, Proliferation. You can see that there are three things that you know is based on. First of all, when I hear the dog box, there is one thing. It's called the I, the capital with the capital I, I, okay? I hear. As versus to, you know, somebody else. I, this I. So there is a, a error notion of that I. And I is so important, we have to capitalize it, right? So my idea, I like, I don't like. Disturbing me, okay? So then this so-called I would go back to my thinking, okay? Going back that, oh, this is a dog, the, the bark of a dog, okay? I hate dogs. Not necessary. I, this is just an example. So why? why? Why do I hate it? Oh, because I have bitten by a dog before. Those are the habitual patterns that we had in the past. Then, then we bring it to the present, and then it's going to continue to the future. Okay, so we're bringing when the mental proliferation or uh, conceptual proliferation start, it related to what we experienced before and then bring it to right now. Okay, why? It's all because of I. I like, I don't like, or I don't care, neutral. Behind this eye, there are three things. It's called tangha, craving, okay? It's called mana, conceit. I'm so important. Didi, wrong view, okay? So those are the thing that actually behind this process of mental proliferation. Any question? So if we ask, you know, 
and this goes both ways. Not necessary wholesome, not necessary unwholesome, not necessary wholesome, neither wholesome nor unwholesome. The reason is, well, I take that back. Because once we have a differentiation that I like, I don't like, we have this conceit there already. Okay. So, so those three things are, I would say, you know, on the unwholesome side, even I like, for example, if we do dana, we do uh, generosity, all depends on the intention. I like to help people out. Why? Because it satisfies myself. I like, right? So you don't think, so people usually, you know, they go and do um, generosity or charity. They have this self-satisfaction there, even though it's not, you know, uh, asking or expecting any reward or return, but this satisfaction is one way of craving. Okay. At the convention uh, level, we say it's okay because, you know, we're trying to get rid of the unwholesome and maintain the wholesome. Okay, you know, if we're happy to help people, it's good. But on the ultimate level or uh, the ultimate truth, then this kind of satisfaction, it's going to keep us go on inside within the circle of samsara because this I still exists. Why this I still exists? Because of ignorance. And like I just mentioned, yeah, we can, you know, uh, maybe eradicate craving, aversion. Ah, but this ignorance, until we attain the Buddhahood, okay? So, that is why I choose this sutta to share with you. It's so important. It's so important. We know where to stop. When people say things back to you, take a deep breath. Don't let this papancha process keep going and going and going. So, um, because, you know, I'm with Mapa for so long, you know, I know that this is an academic um, class, but I really would like to bring in the practice also, just to not only at the knowledge level, intellectual level, but we also have something to base to work on. Um, that's, that's my goal, uh, you know, not necessarily correct them, but. And then uh, the next one is come to the more the co concept side. So far, shall I stop for questions? Everybody understand? Uh, there's if a I couple of questions that came up in chat. Okay, let me take a look. If I can get that, okay, here we go. I need this. So volition is driving our thoughts. Thought. My fault, and I, I didn't explain it, you know, clearly. Volition is when the time to stop the unwholesome uh, 
action. Volition is a mental action. Okay, but it's not, you know, it's not the drive to kick on the process of papancha. The process of papancha, well, all depends on which uh, school of thought. The function of the sixth conscien consciousness, we have like the five aggregates. Remember, we have the, the form, what? Feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, right? So on the form side, we call it what? Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the mind. Mind, we, you know, all depends on what you want to name it. The mind is actually uh, the sixth consciousness. But before the sixth consciousness, the five different sense doors, they each had different consciousness. I, I consciousness, ear, ear consciousness, nose, nose consciousness, tongue, tongue consciousness, and then the body consciousness. When all these five, each one of the, the, the five come touching the external object with the condition, what condition? The eye, if there is light, color, shape, then our eye will be able to cognize, provide it. Our physical form, the eye with eyeball, lens, and everything is intact. Then that will kick on or give rise to the eye faculty when all the conditions favorable for that faculty to, uh, for, for the uh, eye consciousness to arise. So we, it's just like a slow motion in a movie. My eye come across to the screen my eye consciousness will start to function, then will give rise to my eye consciousness. So three things intact. Then contact, the, the, the process of contact will start, okay? When that contact starts, feeling arises. I like, not, not even I like, I don't like, it's, Pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. I don't care. Okay. It's neutral. It's just a screen. Okay. Then when feeling arises, it will go to our number six consciousness. Okay. Remember, we have the five consciousness, and then we have number six consciousness, which is the mind consciousness that mind consciousness will pull out information from our previous experience and say that this is a screen. It is too bright. I don't like it. Okay. Then the thinking, which is of like, it's only thinking, not even volition yet. It's thinking that, so I don't like it. What am I going to do? Okay. Then the decision is made. I am going to turn my head away from the screen. Okay. I'm going to shut down my computer. That is, you know, all depends on which school you're talking about. A lot, you know, some of the school lump them together, like thinking start, then decision make, and then action, mental action, okay? Mental action, decision, you know, what to do. Three things, three process will start. 
that is all lumped together into volition. So in order to cut off the unwholesome action, when I see the screen, I don't like it. I'm going to smash my screen. The decision of smashing my screen is an unwholesome action. Shall I actually perform it or not? Ah, that's when you start. Stop making the decision. I see this person. I don't, I really don't like him because he said something bad to me a long time ago. When I see him, I'm going to slap him. So that's the decision. That is the time that we can hold it. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, I, uh, more narrowly than um, I had, uh, uh, it's okay. I was um, drilling down too deeply into a wrong direction. Um, is volition papanchizing? Um, Since volition is yes. a decided action. And that papanchai is even before the volition. Okay, okay. When we start Good. thinking, where, where, where? That's so the that, papanchai. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Make sense? I was trying to wrap volition around papancha. I see. Volition like I said, all depends on which school. And I emphasize because, you know, um, Yogacara will tell you differently. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Yogacara divided the six consciousness, number six consciousness into what? Into consciousness, into mana, into alaya. See? So, mm -hmm. so it all depends on which score. Of course, if you talk to Maria Mika, is that everything is, you know, conditional arising. Why are you doing that? So, mm -hmm. so all depends on which score. Abhidhamma Kosa actually analyzes it very detailed. We'll, we'll come to that when we do the Kosa. It's fun. It's really fun to do that. Nettie, is the, the, the 17 steps of perception, is that in the Abhidharma Kosa? And does that tie in with this? Uh, kosa, it's from the school of Savasthivadi. They, they are verses. When it comes to Vasubandhu, he explained it. Not only that, he pointed out what's wrong with it. Okay, Abhidhamma, it's already there. The 17 steps, the, the uh, 17 uh, moments of thought, it's already included in the Abhidhamma Kosa before. So that's, that is the original Abhidhamma. Okay, but then I, I understand that you guys will do the Theravadan Abhidhamma, right? Uh, next semester, have fun with it. I'm taking classes on it, actually, um, you know, a short class. So yeah, it's very detailed. My goodness, every moment of the thought, you know, they, they, they give you, they assigned um, not only the timing, but they, there are name and forms in there. It's very, very detailed, very interesting. So, um, Josh, do you have a question? And the more mindfulness and clear comprehension, there is more apparent in the process, seeing, defining, defining. Sankara is uh, key too, yeah. Sankara, Sankara. But there's Sankara. There's Sankara. Very good question. Very good question. Am I hearing the echo? I muted it. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, 
Sankara, actually, the real meaning, the actual meaning is called action. So somebody will address it to karmic action, which we cannot say that it's wrong, it's right. Because any action, any, any action, wholesome, unwholesome, unwholesome it's going to bring effect, bring results, right? Sankara, it's the mental action that, again, depends on which score. Some brings the result. Some say that, okay, Sankara brings the result. One example, I hate this person. I'm going to slap him. But it's only in my mind. I didn't do any action. My hands are off. So do I bring any consequences? I was you know, going to kill this person, but I didn't do it. I mean, if, you know, nobody can bring me to the court and say that, hey, he's a, she's a murderer, right? I didn't do it. I, I'm just thinking about it. So does it bring it effect? Does it bring result or not? Yes and no. Yes, to the point that it's accumulative. Don't forget that any kind of even smaller action mentally, it's going to accumulate into a habitual pattern. We've, if, you know, the energy, it's an energy, okay? What we call the underlying energy. So if this kind of energy keep going, roaring like a snowball, one day, trust me, it's going to burst. Okay, so does it bring effect? Yes, internally it brings effect. But, you know, on the conventional side, I didn't kill anybody, you know, nobody can put me in a jail or hang me. Right? Sankara at this point of time is called the mental action. But the mental proliferation comes before the sankara, before we make any mental action or volition, the process already going. And the uh, reason, the energy behind this process is called tangha, mana, and titi. Because we have the wrong view, chances are we have you know, the wrong mental action because we have tangha, we have craving, then we have, you know, this craving of chocolate inside. Because, you know, I am so important. I want to satisfy my eager of, you know, taking the taste of chocolate. Okay, so those are the three things behind that mental proliferation. Those are very negative. Like I said, even with a wholesome action like charity, what is the intention? Okay. Uh, I think uh, we're due for a break if you got time for it. Yes. Uh, this 9.45. We come back at 10. Any question, any? Um, I had one and maybe I missed it, uh, but did we go over like the poly word for volition? Is it Chaitna? Sankara. So Sankara for volition? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, I did write that down. Okay. I have a question. Can, does anyone have a useful um, Pali or Sanskrit like definitions? Like Ted Corey had asked, like a list of these Pali's terminology, because I don't remember what the pancha meant, but I do remember what mental proliferation is. There's a Basically, Pali, I mean, there's a Pali English dictionary. 
Um, it's really hard to go from English to poly, but there's uh, poly to English uh, online. If you just look up poly to English dictionary and okay. you'll, you'll find a bunch, but like Chaitanya does mean volition, uh, but it also means like intention uh, or direction. So that's why I asked for clarification. Uh, but and it also is translated differently in different class or in different schools but um okay but also like, the, if, like basically i just kind of need like notes on some of these terminology yep and it also depends on context to the translation very good Yeah, but that's the same with English, right? We've got words with multiple meanings, and you got to look at context. So, um, it's pretty, I think, in Maba, I don't know, you know, uh, we, we have talked about the papancha uh, many, many times. <laughs> But, uh, you know, for uh, uh, friends that are not familiar with, um, it could be uh, a little bit, you know, um, foreign to them. It would be, it would be easier, you know, for the Chinese speakers, because um, Venerable Master Inshan mentioned it, uh, many, many times in, in various books. The ch Chinese translation of Papancha is Xi Lun. Okay. Xi Lun. So, um, I think the, more, the, the most difficult part to understand would be, to me, would be the contact. When does contact uh, actually function so we i just mentioned like the eye the physical eyeball the faculty remember i said that you know faculty is actually part of the physical form even though we cannot see it if you guys going to study the abhidhamma later on the form, because Abhidhamma analyzed the five aggregates very clearly. On the form side, it will break down into um, various parts of the form, down to the four elements, down to, you know, the space and then consciousness. So the faculty, um, I remember I even seeing the picture of the faculty, okay? So Abhidhamma would be the uh, area to explore if we are interested. So it has to be the physical form, which including the one that we can see, which is the eyeball lens or whatever, and the faculty. So that is considered the physical form. Then external object, then the consciousness, three things together that will kick on the process, what we call contact. With contact, feeling is no escape. Once we have contact, we have feeling. Once we have feeling, perception started. Perception started because you know perception is pulling information from what we learned before that we store in the memory bank. When that start, thinking start. Thinking start, decision start. Decision start, action start. Action start, it's going to be manifest into either verbal or physical. Okay, so to stop the unwanted or unwholesome uh, physical or verbal action, then when it's at the mental action, then we stop the unwholesome action there. 
So it won't be explicit or appear into the verbal or physical action, which bring results. So the question is, is mental action, sankara brings results? Yes, because our mind is work such in a such way that with the accumulation of unwholesome mental volition, then it's going to go into the memory bank or storage. Then that eventually it's going to snowball and roll into such a uh, energy that it's going to burst one time, sometime. Okay, so that is, you know, why to understand the process of papancha is so important. And then we have to understand that why, you know, what happened that we have this kind of mental proliferation. What are the underlying spring? that cause, you know, that for unwholesome actions, it's because we have this eye, okay? We have this tangha craving. We have a wrong view. In the uh, Eightfold Noble Path, right view is number one. Right view is the eye, of the the uh, uh, the other actions, the other uh, noble uh, path, because you know, with the right view, we're going to the right direction. With the wrong view, we're going to the wrong direction. So, it is very very important that to cultivate the right view. How? Okay, again, you know, the, I, I'm going to repeat this again and again because, you know, it's, it really guides where we are going. Associate with the wise, listening to the righteous Dhamma, right? What is the next? Right thinking, you know, considerate, ponder it accordingly, and then Practice accordingly. Okay. And then we have conditions for those four. When we associate with the Dhamma, we asso uh, associate with the wise, we are actually, you know, associate with his wisdom, not the person. We are, we are listening, associating with not the individual person, but according to what he said, the Dhamma, okay? Then we are associating, uh, listening to the Dhamma, it has to be the righteous Dhamma, not just any saying. That is why very careful when we search online for, the teachings, make sure, you know, make sure. Then, uh, let's see, I'm thinking it in, in, in the Chinese. First of all, if then the thing is Luli Siwei. That means, you know, when we are thinking about it, you know, we are thinking it with the, uh, with the reasonable you know, with reasoning. Why is this right? Why is this wrong? And then, uh, and then practice accordingly. Okay. So, so those are the conditions that when whatever we learn, uh, should, we should keep those in mind. So let's go to, because we have time to discuss uh, today, because I scheduled it a um, couple hours. Uh, yeah, one hour to discuss. 
So let's go to the next one, which is called the four knowledges. Um, remember that Mahakachana and also Sariputra, they use analytical skills. Okay, the sutra said, not I did, you know, not that I said it, but the sutra said, right? Remember, they they analyze. Um, um, it's according to Bhikkhu Bodhi's explanation. So, what are the analytical uh, knowledge? First of all, it's analytical knowledge of result, knowing and understand understanding the result. For example, the uh, suffering is a is a result. Knowing suffering is very important, right? We have to admit there are dissatisfactions in life. Somebody won't. They just won't. They said that you know life is too short. Let's just enjoy it. Okay. And then somebody would say that I'm driving a Mercedes, living in a huge mansion. My kids are going to Harvard. You know, my husband are earning tons of money. I can go to whatever uh, name brand store. Or, you know, my wife is so brilliant. She is a professor in nuclear engineering. I mean, tell me what's suffering. Okay, so, so they don't realize that. One day you're going to get sick. One day you're get, get, you know, going to get old. Look at what's around right now with the COVID-19. Changing, changing, changing. People Next. might realize that they're, they're covering up their suffering with all their uh, consumption. Hmm. They just can't face it. Some people cannot face it. So, so um, then the next one is analyze the cause. What caused all these, you know, to happen? Of course, on the convention level, it's like you, you, you do something bad, you know, uh, bad cause, bad result. Okay. So once, you know, the, the, there is like, if I kill somebody, I bound to be put in jail. Well, <laughs> nowadays it's, may not necessary, you know, uh, I mean, Lee knows better, you know, with the um, legal system or, or they're bound to be some different. But that's what we can see. That's what, you know, on the very intellectual level, that's what is appearance. But on the more deeper or profound level, that's not the truth. Why somebody born so rich, so beautiful, so handsome, why the others not? Okay? What causes suffering? What causes the, you know, causes us to be trapped in this circle of samsara? So, you know, on, on a little bit higher level, know the cause. Then the next one would be uh, analyze the language. If I'm speaking, well, then you know, speaking German to us, we won't understand, I won't understand, right? So even if you, you are uh, expounding very deep Dhamma, but if I don't have the language skill, I won't be able to understand, right? So we have to have that kind of knowledge. So number four is, <laughs> this is funny, analytical knowledge of knowledge. 
that means we have to know all the three above. Okay, we have to know how to analyze number one, number two, and number three so that we can absorb, so that the Dhamma will function, so the Dhamma will help us. For number, I think I mentioned about this uh, yesterday, the three steps of how to approach uh, or practice the Four Noble Truths. One is recognize the satisfaction. No suffering. Number two, cut off the cause of suffering. Number three, practice the Four Nobles, uh, Eightfold Noble Path so that we can cut off the cause. Number four is to realize, okay, the cessation. One, two, three are conventional truths. Number four is the ultimate truth. Number one, two, three are conditioned. Even though four, Eightfold Noble Path are uh, virtuous conditions, but they're still your way far. But they, you know, number uh, uh, three, practice the Eightfold Noble Path. It's called your way wu lo fa. That means it's conditioned in the conventional truths, but it's a faultless conditional phenomena. Num number four, the cessation, realized cessation, it's called wu wei wu lo fa, which means that it's unconditioned, it's also perfect, you know, without any fault. So those four, remember? Realize suffering, cut off the cause, practice the path, realize the cessation. Okay, those are very important. And, and those related to the four analytical knowledge, you know, analyze the suffering, analyze, know how to, you know, face the suffering, know how to, what the cause are so that we can cut it off, then, you know, make sure we understand with the capability of language, then the fourth is that all the above we have to know. Question? I have a question. The four analytical knowledge, this is, to me, it sounds like it's based off of the, the um, four noble truths. Am I correct in thinking that they're well, one similar? One and two are the four noble truths. One and two. Mm -hmm. Know the suffering, understanding the cause, right? Right. With Number language, three. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was thinking with uh, knowledge of language and knowledge of knowledge, knowledge of language to me sounds like um, knowledge of like, language meaning Dhamma, and then knowledge of knowledge being like understanding the wisdom of the Dhamma. Am okay. I correct in thinking this or wrong? That's, that's a right way, right uh, stream of thinking. That's very good. Uh, one thing to add is number three, analyze analytical knowledge of language. Why is it, why Buddha put this uh, as one of the uh, important thing is like, we are not Buddha. The teachers are not the Buddha, okay? Only Buddha can do with one kind of language or one word that all sentient beings will understand, but we don't. I can only speak in English and Chinese, right? For those, you know, 
does not understand English and Chinese, you know, whatever I talk about, it's no benefit to them. Right? So, so that is why, you know, we have this party with have the Sanskrit so that we can actually penetrate into the teaching through language. There is no other way that we can understand the teaching other, other than, you know, through reading or language or whatever. But this is a very important tool that we can make use of. So that's why the Buddha put it there. Okay. And then, of course, you know, to have the analytical knowledge, we need wisdom, right? So with the wisdom, we'll be able to understand what it's talking about. Remember the honey ball, you know, this sutra that was talking about the Brahman? He just rolled up his eye and said, huh, whatever, right? So, so that means he doesn't understand. And doesn't understand it doesn't matter. Ask. That's why the disciple, other disciples, they don't understand. They just go to Mahakachana. But the, for this Brahman, he just you know roll up his eye, put up you know use his stick and go away. So when is he going to learn? Okay. So that is why you know an electrical knowledge of knowledge. Again, you know, I think, Danny, you have a very good point that you have to have the wisdom, the eagerness to learn. You don't have the wisdom, you know, for those three above, then you just walk away. Okay. So I think that's very, very important. Good point. Any more question on? The process on the honey ball. If not, then we will move into some recaps. Um, let's see. Okay. Before I forget, I want to say something about, you know, the homework. I know that, you know, we are some of us are, are pretty uh, concerned about the homework. The homework is a take home. That is why it's called homework. It would be about five pages on, you know, uh, in an essay form. And then the format, I think, variable uh, Kong Yen already uh, posted on Slack. And also it's in one of the uh, files that I, post also the format. We have to follow that format when we do our essay. Um, let's see if I can. Do, do you guys have that or? Um... Yeah, it's okay. in Slack. Uh, okay. It was, I'll get a date on it. Um, it was the format was posted on Friday, July thirty first at eight twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. Let's use that format. You know, follow that. Make sure you put your ID, your name, uh, the teacher, the course date. You know, those are very important. So it's a take home. So it, you know, it's more or less like an open book. Uh, because it's in an essay, you know, but when you, when you do, say for example, if you compare the Theravada and the uh, Mahayana, don't just copy and paste, you know, the, the table that I post, okay? You can take the points out from that. Or um, you can, you know, just just use the um, the points, and then you have to go into an essay format and explain it. Do not just use like Mahayana, 
da 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 Theravada, da 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 da. Okay, it's an essay. It, it's not a PowerPoint. It's not just uh, uh, like you know a, a pointed pointed um, piece of work. It's an essay. Okay, so I just want to stress that. But you're welcome to use the key points, the material that you know we went over or or in the notes. So so that's uh, one thing that I thought about last night that maybe I didn't clarify. So um, anything that you like to the reason that I use, you know, the um, note point, it's because to get my, you know, get my um, talking or get the idea concept across to make it a little bit clearer. <clears throat> it's not meant for essays. So, any question? I think time-wise, <clears throat> we're doing pretty close on schedule. Um, for the two suttas, we need to understand the theme or the key concept. Like the first one, SM 22.57, um, that the key thing is the seven case and the three uh, investigation. We have to know what are the seven cases and then you know how to apply those uh, investigations, analyze it, okay? That would be a good topic. So for MN18, the thing is to understand the process of propancha and how does it affect us in the practice? What are the reasons behind those that will lead us to unwholesome actions, okay? So those are the two suttas that uh, the, the, the core teaching on that. Now, as far as for Agama and Nikaya, we have to know, you know, what are the differences between the two or the similarities, how they uh, correspond to each other. Okay, um, as far as for historical background on the Agama, there is not much about it other than when did it uh, get transmitted to China, but um, I won't pay too much attention to it, uh, rather than, you know, knowing the difference between the Agama and Nikaya. Uh, also, you know, what are each of the Agama or Nikaya focus on? Okay, so I have, I think we have uh, the, I have a chart. Yeah, the principle of teaching there. There is, you know, pretty important of that. Um, Cause it's the information is way too much. Now, because the syllabus, one of the mission in the syllabus saying that, you know, how the Chinese canon, because it's so vast, how does it, um, how does it influence 
the Buddhist community or Buddhism in Asia. So that is one of the missions. So we have, as far as for introduction on the canon side, on the Tipitaka, Chinese Tipitaka, we need to know the historical background. You know, we need to know why is it, why Mahayana Buddhism flourished in China. For example, it came to China at a chaos you know, uh, non-stopping war going on at that kind of era, then we have the support of those in power like Liang Wudi, like the emperor or, the, you know, king of the small kingdoms. Even when we go into the Tang Dynasty, the emperor was more favorable in Taoism, but they did not you know suppress okay they they didn't put it as the most important religion they did not suppress they also encourage okay and then we have to know that that you know we have such a great translators like kumarajiva like xianzang that actually helps the uh helps Mahayana Buddhism flourish in China. Okay. So those are the historical background. And also because of the political situation, monks and nuns went from mainland China to Southeast Asia, especially in Taiwan, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, various you know, various Southeast Asian countries, especially Japan, Korea. Japan and Korea actually send missionaries or monks or even scholars to get to learn from the uh, Chinese teachers, okay? And how does it influence the uh, the the uh, Buddhist community. A few schools had great impact. Number one is the Lotus Sutra. We know that in Japan, they have the uh, Rijinin school. Actually, you know, they they are following the Lotus. The other one is the uh, Avasanka, uh, what do we call the Garland Sutra. That one, it's nowadays a lot of monasteries in Taiwan and you know, everywhere still chanting or practicing that, okay? The Chan school, it's all also very important, okay? The Pure Land school, so four, Lotus School, Pure Land, Chan, and then the flower uh, ornament. Those are very influential, other than the Tibetan. I mean, Tibetan is one of them. And then again, with the same historical background, Dalai Lama, you know, came up, you know, escaped from China, from the Communist Party to India. So those are the basic knowledge that we have to know uh, within the Buddhist community, it's, you know, have some basic information. So um, I think that's what we have been talking about. If there are additional information like the histo historical background, you you know, I, I, I don't think I put it into the, um, my notes. But if you need more information on that, let me know. Just, you know, shoot me a note on Slack and then I will, you know, uh, 
a work on a file or, or a spreadsheet so that, you know, uh, you guys have some, something on hand to, to refer to. Question? We can start our discussion. I think it's a, a little bit more um, difficulty in the introduction part because, you know, um, it's a little bit complicated in understanding the, the, the history and what's going on. So, and also, you know, uh, understand how from the 18th school, um, take it back, from the 8th school of the Chinese Buddhism, come down to the three stream of thinking. Any, any question about my, my question here? So let's start with the eight schools. We know that you know the the, the spreadsheet, uh, the table that I put out. There are ten. It listed ten, right? But the two of them are Theravada, the Kosa, and also the Chen uh, Shilun. Those two are uh, Theravada. So start from the three sastras down to the lotus, the garden, the chan, the principle, uh, the mantra school, um, the yogacara school, and the pure land. Those are the eight schools. But when, I don't know if I can post that. Uh, let me see. Need to stop sharing. Then I go to... Okay. I'm getting a little bit better, Corey. That's good. The more you use it, the easier it'll get. <laughs> good. So. Uh, yeah. See the slide here? Okay, those eight schools. When we look at the right hand side, you see it boils down to Madhyamika, Yogacara, and Tathagatagaba. You see what I mean? Okay. So actually, um, these schools, other than, let me see, other than uh, the Lotus or Tiantai school, it include the Madhyamika and Tathagatagaba. That is why I said that, you know, the Tiantai school or the Lotus school is an embracing. Okay. So at the end, everybody attend Buddhahood. So there is only one vehicle, not Hinayana, not Mahayana, not even the Bodhisattva, but it's the Buddha vehicle. Okay, the one Buddha vehicle. So boil down to one vehicle. So it's all embracing. So that is why I put, uh, I, I forgot to put Yogacara in there too. So, so um, it comes down, the eight school comes down to Madhyamika, Yogacara, and Tathagatagaba. Okay. 
if we understand that the school is a school, they base on taxes, they base on sutras or sastras, but then the concept behind that sastra or sutta or sutra is those three concepts, three streams of thinking, okay? And Venerable Master In Sun, I'm trying to find the current school. Yeah, yeah. He classified or categorized into these three things, okay? The Madhyamika actually based on the Paramita Sutra. Yogacara, they have a different, you know, basis. But one thing very important is like, at the beginning of the Yogacara school, it, they serve as a bridge from the Madhyamika going into the Yogacara. So there is a you know, process into that. Okay. Uh, and the Tathagata, you know, they base, they actually base on Yogacara because a lot of things, uh, they agree with the Yogacara because, you know, uh, Yogacara was saying that there must be something to base, to, to, to going through the uh, cycle of samsara. If you're saying that everything is empty, then who's going through samsara? So those are the questions, okay? But we will explore later when, uh, when we get to there. Question? Any comment at all? Those are the things that we need to know. Uh, so Caddy, this is uh, Josh. Hi, Josh. Um, real, real quick, this is kind of going back. Do you know the text for the four types of analytical knowledge where that's talked about? Um, let's see. Or where that's from? It's from the sutta itself. It mentioned about the four knowledge. Um, the MN18. Okay, thank you. And also you can look up uh, in the word of the Buddha by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It has the footnotes on those. If you have the book, we, we all, we, we have studied the book, right? In the Buddha's word by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Anybody question? Because we can go into discussion now. You guys are so smart, no question. There's a question from Jade in the chat, and there are Chinese words that I can't oh, translate okay. for you. That what are the differences between something versus something if there is any? Oh, sorry, because, you know, my screen is so small. If I open the chat, it's going to cover half of my thing. Okay. What is papancha? Okay. Let me answer Venerable Kongzhen. Papancha in the Chinese is called Xi Lun. Uh, English is mental proliferation or conceptual proliferation. Good. 
good. Corey already answered that. Uh, is homework assignment the question you gave? <laughs> uh, I will send out the homework like Wednesday, if not, you know, Thursday morning, give you enough time to work on it. Like I said, I don't want to see a table format or, you know, a dot the point format. It's an essay, okay, with explanation. So, so, um, like, for example, if I ask, um, the process of papancha, for example. I don't just cut and paste of the slide that I send and say that, you know, and then, well, you can do that with explanation, okay? You can, you can use this, the, uh, the slide that, that, you know, the, the uh, drawing to start with and then trying to explain each process. You can do that. Uh, if I ask the question that, remember we do uh, the 18, the differences between Mahayana and uh, Theravada. You know, I have like Theravada on one side, Mahayana on the other side, and, and, and uh, with diff, uh, 20 categories. I think, you know, Buddha, uh, Theravada would say that, Mahayana would say that, Bardo, uh, sutras, languages, you know, all those 20, I think 20 items of those. And, and you know, don't just use a, a daughter form and say that, okay, uh, like, what, what do you call that? It's, what do you call that? Let me, let me go to my, uh, Let me go to this. Bullet points. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't use bullet points. Okay, just say one, two, three, four. You can do the bullet point if you have a listing of like, uh, like here are, you know, those uh, examples or whatever. But don't use like a note form into a bullet point. It's an essay. What I'm trying to stress is, make sense? Okay, but don't worry too much. It, you know, <laughs> you 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 will get the the forty uh, percent, but you know, maybe uh, the the final would be a little bit, you know, that, that you have to work on because the final, I don't have a total say on that because it all depends on the university. Okay, Jay's I'll, question, go ahead. I, I was just wondering if, if you had this back a little bit too, um, with um, the historical, um, the environment in China uh, mm -hmm. during Buddhism's uh, flourishing. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, examples of, say, uh, like a, an edict or or a pronouncement or something from the dynasties that indicate that um, they are um, in support of uh, a religious, say, religious freedom or Buddhism in particular? Um. When Buddhism, and then I think we went over this, came to China, it's the time that it started in the Han Dynasty, right? Officially, I mean, the record shows that actually it came earlier, but nobody pays any attention. So when people, you know, start to pay attention, it's in Eastern Han Dynasty with the, with the, the dream of an emperor. Remember that? 
Okay, so uh, the White Horse Temple, is that something that the Han Dynasty, uh, it's a Buddhist temple built uh, uh, by Luoyang. patronage of the Han Dynasty? Uh, Luoyang, let's see. I'm not 100% sure, but I know that the White uh, Horse Temple is in Luoyang. Um, let, me, let me do some research on that one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it would be interesting to see if there was an actual, um, uh, say, um, a positive um, uh, influence rather than uh, as opposed to a hands-off sort of right. thing. Right, understand. Okay. Okay. All right. I will Thank provide you. those information. I will actually work out the file with a little bit more of the background on how and why it's, you know, Mahayana Buddhism flourishing. Uh, in uh, China, let me let me put some more information, like maybe you know a few points that you guys can work on. How about that? Sounds good. Okay, good. So Jay's question: three vehicles, Savaka, uh, Pajeka, and uh, Bodhisattva. Jay, you are way ahead of me. In the Buddha's complete teaching, Yuan Jiao, according to Tiantai School. Okay, we'll go to the Tiantai School at the end. This Xian, Xian Zhong Dao Fo Xing, Fo Xing Chang. This awakened state does not require the ordinary steps such as a repentance. Um, okay, Jay's question was like, what is the difference between the path of Bodhisattva and also, you know, the one Buddha uh, path? In the Lotus Sutra, it, if, you know, um, divided into like, because at that time, people were practicing either Savaka, Prajaka, or the Bodhisattva path, right? Do I ha have to explain what are those three paths? Or you, you already know? Okay, you already know. Zhidao, huh? Okay, that's good. So, so the Bodhisattva path is more Mahayana. We all know that. But then because, you know, those who practice the Savaka or Prajaka uh, path was thinking about, you know, the, was excluded actually, uh, being looked down by what they call the Bodhisattva path practitioner. So Lotus Sutra was saying that don't do that because whether you're Prajaka, whether you're Savaka, whether you're Bodhisattva, everybody's goal is become attained, you know, be, uh, the goal is to attain Buddhahood. Okay. No matter where, you know, you, you take the airplane, you drive, you swim, you, you're going to get to this goal. So, that is what the Buddhahood, what the uh, the vehicle of the Buddha, Yi Fu Chen. Okay, so it's kind of embracing everybody. The tool, the practice is different, but eventually, you know, you're going to be named or predicted by the Buddha that you're going to attain Buddhahood. Okay, and then yes, uh, Jay was talking about the Yuan Jiao because this is Ten Tai School's specialty on classification of different teachings of the Buddha at the different point of time or period of time based on the faculty of the practitioner.
Yeah, true. So, any question on that? Jay, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, good, good. Okay. Yeah, good point, Josh. Um, I don't want to put the negative uh, <clears throat> point um, or, you know, discourage. We just got started. <clears throat> there are a lot of things that we have to explore. It's going to be, at this point, you know, it's just like climbing the slope. We're going uphill a little bit. You know, the, the slope is not that stiff at the time, you know, then then we go up, go up, we go up a little bit, go up a little bit, and then it's going to, you know, stay, 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 okay. So, so that means what? <laughs> that means it's arising, staying for a little while, and then eventually, you know, the class will end. So it shows, you know, anything, everything, all phenomena are impermanent in its nature. Okay. Um, do we want a break now? And then we'll come back to discuss sure. more. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just post me any question. I'll keep the chat room open at this point of time. <clears throat> um, okay. So... I think for the rest of the morning, we can do some discussion because that's, you know, what I scheduled. Any question about, you know, what we previously discussed it, <clears throat> that you want me to go over, explain or comment? You know, we were talking um, before one of the breaks or uh, about the, the name Honeyball. And we were, I think some of us said it might have been referring to a tree and then some, it might be referring to something else, maybe both, maybe some clarification on that word and the, the meaning and significance of it, if nobody else has any questions. Um, whose question is that? Is it David or who? I'm sorry. That was oh, Josh. that was it was Josh speaking. Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry, because I yeah. can't okay. recognize. I think it's in the sutta. The answer is in the sutta, right, Frank? I didn't think it was that specific that I could figure out what they were talking about. Yeah, this is Josh again. That's what we were talking about too. We were trying. We were rereading it, looking for that uh, kind it's, of explanation. It's the last verse of the sutta. The Buddha says this sutra is like a man who is famished, hungry, finding a ball of honey and it's sweet and satisfying. This sutra is like that, so we should call it the honey ball sutra. But isn't it mentioned earlier in the sutra, it, I don't think it had anything to do with honey when no, it was I, first that's mentioned. From the formatting of the thing. Yeah, yeah. It's not actually in. Oh, it's not actually supposed to be in yeah. there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the title was within the text. So as I'm reading it, I'm reading the words, the honey ball. And I'm yeah. wondering where, where on the base of the tree is the honey ball. So, yeah, you look at a different version of it. There's, there's no other honey ball in it. That's just. Okay. My other thought would have been then, uh, 
yeah, they were talking about heartwood and well, when the heartwood's gone, you can have trees and that a bee's in the middle of the tree and there might be a honey ball. <laughs> yeah, they're two different metaphors. So the, the tree they're talking about seeking heartwood and instead seeing all the branches and the leaves. That's papancha, right? The mm -hmm. proliferation of branches mm. is like papancha. You don't see the heartwood, you know, the core. Instead, you see the proliferation of all the little branches and things that arise from the trunk. So oh, thanks, guys, for clarifying that. That's, yes. Very good. Excellent. Yeah, it helps me, too, because I couldn't figure it out. Actually, it's the sutra named by the Buddha at the end, like uh, Sherry was talking about. I think the key thing is like to um, to understand the core teaching. I would focus more on papancha. Any other question? So, um, I did some looking up. Like you were talking about sankara. Mm -hmm which is actually formations, correct? Actions. Sankara is actions? Okay, and then volition though, what? Volition is a mental formation, which is a mental action, which is Sankara. Okay, I was just trying to wrap my head around it because I feel like volition is mental intention. Am I wrong on thinking that though? It's the three process, remember? The six consciousness has, you know, uh, three functions. One is to think. The other one is to uh, make the decision. Number three is to carry out that, that decision in action. All three of them are mental. Right. So when we talk about action immediately, we would think about you know, physical or verbal. But before that, the three process already started and we can la label it as uh, Sankara. Sankara is more towards the end decision, how, you know, which is your right intention. What I'm going to do, that is the decision making part of it. Okay. But right now, because, you know, we have to understand it, we have to separate them one by one. In reality, it's one for all, all for one. The three are actually inseparable. But because we have to understand, you know, the sequence of the thought, then we kind of um, analyze it as if they are, you know, one, two, three. But all of them happen just at one thought, in one thought, okay? So like the determine, determining, uh, then the, the formation or no? The first we think, what, what am I going to do? When the, when, um, the feeling arises that we pull out from our memory bank, the perception and label it, then what are we going to do? That's okay. the thinking process, right? And then, okay, after thinking, I decided what to do mentally. And then I'm carrying it out mentally. Okay. I get it. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. It, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to actually sink in because 
this just happened even you know faster than a snap of the finger but we have to you know to understand the process we have to like slow motion you know all thinking first decision and then action okay all right. well, by the time if, if i'm lucky enough by the time i'm aware of it uh, the feeling is well underway no feeling comes first. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not noticing the contact, right? It's just that that's so fast. I'm, it's the awareness is there before I realize it. I'm realizing that, and then, like I say, the feeling's well underway. I mean, it's it's been there probably a while by the time I realize it's yeah. it's, it's it has arise, mm -hmm. it has arisen. I should say. Oh yeah. Yeah, it happened. You know, all these when I sometimes I'm aware of it after the fact <laughs> so that's a little late yeah it's because you know that is why i said that how people practice first of all we have to sharpen our faculties of the mind okay we have to use that <clears throat> the awareness and mindfulness first you know we have to aware and we have to mindful then then we're able to realize that oh actually this is happening so we have then we have to you know uh, make the decision to take action on either for or against that is where you know the four efforts the four right efforts comes remember what are the four right efforts anybody Yes, and then I'll comment uh, on uh, Sankara again. Um, so yeah, you want to um, root out uh, unwholesome, um, um, the unwholesome, and then prevent more unwholesome from arising. And then you want to um, 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 let's see, the, you you want to for the wholesome, you want to um, maintain um, generate new wholesome. I don't know if these are in the right order. Generate new wholesome um, actions and our wholesomeness and then you want to uh, maintain um, wholesomeness am I fairly correct there yeah I think Sherry Sherry will be able to explain. yeah she can do a little more eloquently than I <laughs> uh, you want to maintain wholesome conditions that have already arisen um, stop unwholesome conditions that have arisen prevent new unwholesome conditions from arising and encourage um, wholesome conditions to arise that have not arisen yet perfect are those labeled the same thing as the four great efforts yeah same thing four right efforts four great efforts okay okay or for right energy, for great energy. So it's like pre um, um, eradication, prevention, and then maintaining and um, generating. So the first two are unwholesome, the second two are wholesome. Um, the, as far as the Sankara, I mean, this stuff is so complicated. The overall thing we could probably all agree on is that with more you can't have enough mindfulness so the more mindfulness we have the more we can see into the nature of these things and they become more apparent um the article that i shared on different types of sankara i mean there's mono sankara there's a uh, vaishi sankara v-a-c-i and then kaya sankara um you know mono sankara the thoughts that come automatically to the mind when a sense object is experienced then if that object of interest, and then if that object of, is of interest, we start generating conscious thoughts, speaking to ourselves without talking, and then we may speak out. Both of these are ve Veshi Sankara. Uh, I don't know the pronunciation. If we then start moving body parts to respond, then those are initiated by Kaya Sankara. So I mean, yeah, the, the Dhamma is so deep and profound, so subtle, and it's hard to understand just by reasoning, right? So. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, 
we don't want to go too deep into that because or else you know it's uh it would be like it's good to know actually um but like i said you know for the time being let's focus on papancha because that's the core teaching of uh mn18 sure yeah uh, yes but exactly. it's good it's good to know mm. that you know we we can like on each sutra or each sutta we can you know go into very deep because buddha does not speak of any or waste any time or speak of anything that is not useful for the practice and getting us out of suffering okay um we can go into very deep but at this point of time we can you know for this course we can only focus on uh the the things that that are more key points at this point but it's good to know thank you yes exactly it, it depends on uh con or you know who's who's all present and what the time is and context and uh, right. what we're trying to do papancha i like to uh, i've heard it explained as being maybe uh, being lost in thought and not really realizing that or being in a trance of thinking and having no idea um, that it's really going on mm -hmm. and it just keeps going and going yeah mm -hmm. exponentially until it's mindfulness is brought to it right or it just plays out so any other comment or questions i have a question really quick <clears throat> okay. the, i was looking at um the seven cases sutta, and it's talking about a triple investigator. It almost seems like it just kind of mentions triple investigator, but it doesn't really explain that very much. And it looks like the Pali word in the notes is different from the word for the um, seven factors of enlightenment investigation. So I don't know, are these other references uh Datu, Samyutta, and the other ones that are mentioned by Bhikkhu Bodhi in the notes. Do they explain more, do you know, about triple investigator? Because I hadn't really heard about triple investigator before. Okay. Um when I look at it, I I look at it from Thanissaro's uh translation. And also I look at uh Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation so i don't know if you read sanisaro's uh uh translation or not i don't think both of them are uh go into detail on the on the triple investigation um what i did is i look at the chinese version of the sutta which you know instead of the the Nikaya, I look into Agama uh, that corresponded to this uh, SN um, 22.55. So um, a teacher, a Chinese teacher in Taiwan called Zhuang Chunjiang, okay, I think most of our uh, Chinese speaker uh, friends probably know about him. So he did some explanation on that. That is where I pulled out this table, uh, the seven cases in uh, five investigations. And also in that tax, um, let me pull this out real quick. Okay, now uh, I didn't, you know, when I prepared the notes, I didn't have time to transfer, uh, uh, translate the triple investigation 
they, they did explain it pretty clearly, including Master Inson's uh, Master Inson's uh, explanation, which he Master Inson explained it in his book called Fo Fa Gai Lun, okay, the essence of the Dhamma. So uh, it kind of explain what these uh, triple investigation is. Let me, you know, briefly go over it. It says like how to investigate. First, you know, we have to observe the five aggregates and then we observe the six realms. We observe the 18 datus, which are um, the 18, uh, datu, how do I say it? It also, you know, translate as rims. Oh, okay. Never mind. Again, five aggregates, the six uh, uh, sand spaces, then the 18 rims. Okay, this is how available in Sun uh, explained that. So there are a, another sutta, and I'll post it. Uh, I'll post it. Another sutra uh, explained it. So, but it is it is in Chinese. Let me see if I can find the uh, Nikaya parallel to it, because in Chinese it's um, uh, the the Samyutta Nikaya, the uh, Samyutta Agama of. 397 Sutta. So I'll find the para and I'll post it. Maybe that will explain it because it tells you uh, how to investigate, like the five aggregates. Okay, five aggregates. How do we how do we investigate? We investigate that these the form. The form is nothing but the four elements, right? So the four elements, it's rising and, and you know, arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. We, I think we talked about that yesterday. Even though the seven cases, when we look at the, um, the Four Noble Truths, number one, if you, you, can you guys see the, did I share it or didn't I? Maybe I should share it. Okay, here we go. Just one second. See this? This uh, table? So number one is suffering. We have to directly look, know. Then with the form, okay, so what is this form? What is what we call the, this physical body? It's nothing but you know, a composition of the four elements, right? So that's how we investigate it. Okay. And then we go across the feeling. What are the feelings? The feelings are, it says six classes, wholesome, unwholesome. Uh, let's see. I, th I think I have, did I put, put out the feeling, six cases of feeling at all? I'm looking. I'm trying to look at. <laughs> okay. If I don't, then you know, let me let me repost those. Then it, it would be easier to understand that. I think it's in the sutra. Okay. I think it's in the sutra. Uh, maybe that's why I did not. Yeah, I think it's in the sutra if I remember it correctly. Okay. <clears throat> if you look at the sutra, uh, the Kobodi's explanation, the uh, 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 translation there. 
Okay, it says he understand feeling, perception, volition, um, consciousness, and its origin, its cessation. You know, that's how we investigate uh, what is the feeling, what is the perception, volition, and all those. So how it arise, what, it, what caused it to arise uh, that, you know, we actually, um, what is the gratification at that point? And then, uh, you know, it's impermanence, it's suffering. So this is how we investigate. Okay, and we go to each item and repeating the same thing. It's in the sutra. I think that's that's how. That's um, okay. Let me. Okay, like the feeling here. It says the pleasure and joy that arise in depending. On feeling, this is uh, the gratification of free feeling. So, so go into each item that is listed on the six cases and analyze it, knowing its cause, and then uh, understand how it arises, and then you know, um, do not attach, you know, just detach from the the clinging, craving for it. So, on the sutra. Every single one, I think it, it posted, it's explained it in the sutra. I think that's, maybe that is why I did not, uh, I did not, you know, specifically put an explanation. Okay. Let me go back and do some detail explanation on this table. Maybe in that way, that we will understand uh, a little bit more. I'm glad that you know, Jeff. You 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 uh, you know you you asked the question. I just went through the form, but the, the you know the rest I did not put in details because in my mind I thought that you know if we understand one, we'll understand all those. But looks like, you know, the six classes of feeling, what are the six classes of feeling? It's not, you know, it's not, it's on the form, but uh, I did not put in detail explanation. I thought that, you know, if that's, uh, that's probably what I need to do. Okay, good job. So I'll try to put the, uh, I'll try to post it uh, tomorrow morning. So give me a little time to work on it. But if you actually read the, you know, read the sutta, then you might have some idea of, of uh, how to investigate in a, in a way. Yeah, I think if they're in the sutta, I feel like yeah. that yeah. you might not have to redo all yeah. that. But, you know, uh, at least, yeah. At least we know that you know what. What are the six cases of feeling? You know, wholesome, mm -hmm. unwholesome, uh, 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 pleasant, unpleasant. Uh, you know those those class. So I'll put that out. In the four noble truths, it's a little bit easier because you know there is the just the four noble truths. I think four noble truths. It's difficult to investigate. It takes uh, a very seasoned practitioner. Honestly, um, it's difficult. The vulnerable truths, you know, if we can penetrate into vulnerable truths, I mean, we understand. Let me put it that way. We understand intellectually. But as far as, as for penetrating into it it's very difficult so good good question but if you read i wish everybody will be able to do that the chinese version is really clear 
okay? Really clear. Okay, any other question that, you know, please feel free to let me know that, you know, if you, you need further clarification. That's why we are here for. I mean, you know, we learn from each other, we share. Anything else? Maybe, you know, you guys can go to go and read the Pali. Then they said that, you know, if you can read the Pali, you can actually grasp the teaching much better. How advanced do you think our Pali class was? <laughs> So you guys should be experts by now. <laughs> <laughs> I gave my, all mine back to my professor. In the Chinese language, it had this this sentence. I think is very important. It said, you know. To be liberated, everything is taught in the seven cases and three investigation. That is to uh, familiarize and uh, let me trans translate this word here. Skill, wow, very good. Proficient, not only familiarized. Proficient in these seven uh, cases. If we are able to be skillful, uh, you know, with the seven cases, then we're able to um, get out of suffering. Another sutta, you guys, well, let me let me see if I can find that again. It's the um, the Buddha talking to Rahula, his his son. That's another sutra. How to detach from I, uh, my viewpoint, conceit, and also um, the the bondage all these so the the way he taught rahula is like you observe what happened with the six elements not four not only four because it added like earth water fire wind space and consciousness you have to be aware and understand them So, any more question, comment, discussion? I think I rem this is Josh. I think I remember too the seven modes of investigation uh, with the four noble truths themselves. Each one, you know, are the you know the um, knowing the origin of each noble truth, um, the cessation, and how it was actually um, arrived at. So you understand the whole process of how it arises, how it ceases, how you came to that knowledge, and then. Um, yeah, and then all as well as the gratification, the danger, the escape of each four noble truth. Yeah, that's that's you know the table. 
that on the number number four that is you know the table that that we put up so the three uh, gratification danger and escape we use that technique understand you know use that kind of technique to to observe one two three and four yes and I, it's a downwards, but also across yeah, and the whole table is, is applied to the aggregates, and that whole method of investigation um, can be applied to the, each Four Noble Truths as well, right? So. Yeah, Four Noble Truths is the, the, uh, the number four on the table. See? Well, that's you're right. That's the path. Right? I mean, that's the Eightfold Noble Path. But I'm saying when, when you can investigate each Four Noble Truths by doing number one, the... Um, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the, or, uh, maybe it's not seven. Number two, yeah, so the yeah, first noble truth three, directly. Um, what is the origin of the first noble truth, the cessation of the first noble truth? Um, you know, how, how, did, how, how does that happen, the process? So I guess that's a little bit different than four. And then also the gratification of the first noble truth, the danger, and then they escape up from it. And then, you know, I guess they all enter, those would, there's intersections and stuff like that. It just has to, it's a lot of time to go through each one, one by one and spending um, time investigating and, and knowing directly, right? But anyway, I, it is kind of a tangent, I apologize. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, the key point that is why, you know, we put out the table that, uh, so that we can, you know, uh, understand that. So I think, I think, Jeff, you got a good point of, uh, you know, try to go into like um, the three investigation because, you know, we, we have to, We lost audio, I did. No, I lost video too. Her uh, her face is frozen. Uh. I mean, it is lunchtime, so maybe maybe Zoom was just like, let's cut it off now. So, uh, I'll text her. Oh, my internet is unstable. But anyhow, oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, did you see the three investigation on, you know, on the share screen? What page is that on in the handout? Yeah, we can see. Okay, so number two, investigate by way of sense basis, and I forgot to put on, you know, the rest of them. It says observe, observe what's happening. So that's that's one of the way to investigate. Make sense? It's really difficult to see your screen. It does. Yeah. Okay. Good. good. It's difficult to see your screen. It's so small, unless it's just my eyes. Yeah, it's it's very small because it's a word uh, format, but it's on. You know, I post that too. It looks fine on my end. Is that N A one? Uh, NA2. NA2. Yeah. And where? you can make that screen. You, you can enlarge uh, the share screen. You can enlarge it on your computer. Mm -hmm. I, I can? It on my, yeah. See where it says 160, Caddy? Huh? See where it says 160? You can do that. You can enlarge your share screen. Oh, I see. Go to 200. Okay, there you go. Is it better? Yeah. It's magic. Oh, great. This is, yeah, this is good. But you, you can share on, you can do it on your own screen too. You can enlarge it. Okay. I don't know how. Oh, let me, let me enlarge it a little bit more. Lee, go up to um, the top and you can see it says you can resize the screen. Go into it's view it's options, options, zoom ratio, and then change it in there but uh we're cutting into lunchtime here 
Yeah. We can uh, come back and discuss, you know, um, if we have time this afternoon. Oh, okay. But just post me the question, any, any comment or question that, you know, I can answer. Okay. Uh, what time are we coming back? Just to be sure. 1.15. 1.15. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. So see you guys. Have good lunch. See ya. Lunch. Open Thank mic. Good day. So I'm just going to leave, or I'm going to be in the room, but uh, Fran, you have co-host.